Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 751, 751, April 14th, 2019, Sunday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, just uh, going to get to some uh, uh, news, news headline topics here and then uh, pick up a little bit uh, from what we talked about yesterday with uh, this uh, sort of, I don't know, strange event with the arrest of Julian Assange, how all that went down, the timing of it. It's been about 24, uh, I guess 48 hours now. Uh, a lot of people have had a chance to think about this and uh, make comments on it. And so, um, anyway, uh, I've had some time now because when I first talked about it, it was all just, just a lot of ideas just blowing in my mind. I really hadn't had a chance to sit back and get into some deep thought about it but uh, or see any other commentary or get other information. So now there's some more information out there. Uh, we've had a little time to let it kind of work its way through my mind. And uh, so I want to follow up on some of those uh, ideas from yesterday and also uh, talk about uh, what I think will be the next uh, major thing that will occur in the unwinding of the Spygate uh, uh, fiasco. So let's just cover just a couple things here and then we'll move on to that. So uh, I thought what was really interesting um, uh, yesterday was an interview with uh, Jay Sekulow, which is, of course, one of uh, uh, Trump's lawyers. And he was discussing... Uh, you know, this whole issue with uh, what had gone on in the Mueller investigation. And he says <clears throat> that there had been three FISAs that were denied back in the early to mid-summer of 2016. Three that were denied in the early summer of 2016. Now, we knew about one of those. We knew there was one FISA uh, back in, I think, June or... I think it was uh, maybe June or early early July, there was a FISA that we've already known about this for a long time that was declined. Never really knew who that FISA was on. But Jay Sekulow says there were three FISAs that were rejected by the FISA court um, prior to the successful FISA on Carter Page in October of 2016. And it's being speculated now that one of those FISA, at least one of those FISA applications that was rejected, likely would have been Michael Flynn. And we talked about last week that this was kind of being rumored. And, you know, if it turns out, remember, uh, Michael Flynn at this time, in, in, if we're talking late 2015, I believe at that time, uh, well, no, he was probably gone from Obama administration by then, but still, you're talking about the guy who was just, you know, a three-star general, uh, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and you have, I mean, here you have the head, previous head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and just six months or so later, uh, they're trying to get a FISA on him. And we know about the little setup that went on with Stefan Halper in London, uh, and of course now we know that the woman who supposedly, uh, this researcher, uh, uh, she's now come out and said that she believes Flynn was set up and she was used in the plot and that Halper needs to be investigated. And so it's just extraordinary when you think about it that they would use such a, such a plot, you know, they would use a guy like Halper to run this little setup and say, yeah, I think Flynn is, is, you know, getting a little close with this woman who's Russian and they were talking about going to Moscow and it, when in fact... The entire thing was a setup. They invited Flynn there. They made sure he was sitting next to the woman. Christopher Steele was literally sitting right behind them so that he could eavesdrop on what they were talking about. Uh, the whole thing was a setup. And the fact that they would have the balls to, to, uh, to, get, a, to get a FISA on Michael Flynn based on what was essentially a, you know, a, a thrown together sort of uh, setup on him. And this just shows, I mean, how maniacal that these people are. And of course, we know it has everything to do with Flynn being targeted by Obama and his administration because, quite honestly, I think Michael Flynn knew about what was going on in Syria and other places in Iraq where they were essentially helping Al-Qaeda. Obama was literally drop shipping uh, uh, weapons, uh, I, probably money, uh, other forms of support, uh, to groups who were uh, aligned with Al-Qaeda uh, and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And so Flynn knew about all this, and obviously he wasn't in agreement with it. And he was obviously talking, maybe to other people, 
uh, other military people saying, you know, this thing we're doing, you know, I mean, I don't know, what are we doing? What in the world are we doing? And so it was pretty obvious the Obama administration, of course, got word that, you know, you got this guy, Michael Flynn, um, and he's obviously, a, you know, serving your administration, but he's not down with your policy, and he's talking and things and such. So I think that there was a target on Michael Flynn primarily long before he ever thought about joining the Trump administration or even before Trump even announced he was running for president, Michael Flynn was already a target and it was uh, having a lot to do with his um, having a policy uh, that was that he that being opposed to Obama's policy. And of course we have Papagopoulos saying that he was likely under surveillance prior to uh, joining the Trump administration because of the work that he was doing uh, on energy in the Mediterranean it w was in opposition to the Obama administration. So what this does is it paints a picture for us of something else that's kind of out there on the, uh, uh, you know, out there on the exterior somewhere, but it does kind of paint a picture where Obama was a very vindictive guy. Uh, this is quite clear from what we're learning about these two instances. You know, if you were uh, in the Obama administration and you, you didn't, you know, fall perfectly in line with uh, his 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 uh, ideology or his uh, policies or whatever, he would target you personally to take you out, to ruin you, to destroy you, to get rid of you. And he did get rid of Flynn. Uh, in the case of Papagopoulos, he was working for the Hudson Institute, but they obviously had him targeted. And uh, we know that this because this is what Papagopoulos says that Halper and Downer both took him to task over, was about his policy positions uh, on the energy and in the, in the, in, in his... Uh, support for certain policies that were in opposition to Obama. And here's the same thing with Michael Flynn. He's opposed to Obama policies. And this is how these two guys fell under the microscope and began uh, getting targeted. So it tells us that Obama was definitely the type of person who would use the full power that he, that he had and even powers he should not have been able to use. He would do anything pretty much uh, to target people who didn't fall in line or outside of his uh, ideology or policy objectives. And um, so this is very important uh, in the Spygate story because it, it gives us some supporting evidence that is unbelievable as it is that all these things were set into motion for Spygate. Uh, when you look at Obama and how he treated people in his administration or even outside of his administration who were not down with his ideology or going along with his policies, he targeted people. He targeted people who he believed were, uh, I assume, his enemies or certainly adversaries. And this is how Michael Flynn and Papagopoulos first were targeted. They were targeted by Obama before anything happened with Trump or joining the Trump campaign or even before Trump announced he was running for president. They were targets because of they opposed Obama ideology and policies. And this tells us a lot about Obama. And if Obama would target Flynn and Papagopoulos because of ideology differences, policy differences, surely Donald Trump uh, being completely 180 degrees in opposition to and then going out there on the campaign trail and dogging Obama every day, talking about the failures of Obama's policies, this uh, certainly would reinforce why Obama would allow uh, or even direct uh, something like a spy gate to happen. You know, he was, um, he didn't exercise very much caution here. You got to wonder if he ever stepped back and thought, you know, what if, you know, what if this doesn't work out? What if Hillary doesn't win? What if this comes back to bite me? It's like he, he never thought maybe that that could happen because he just trudged forward. And we can see that, uh, uh, as in the case with Flynn and Papagopoulos and probably others, uh, when you, when you disagree with, uh, Obama, uh, he took it personally, and he took every measure possible to go after you. And this is going to come into play when we get to this spy gate, when we get down to the point where we start asking the question, exactly how much did Obama know? How much was he along for the ride? Was he just a wink and a nod? Or was he directing traffic? Was he, was he a main driver? I mean, how deep was his role? And I think when you look at the Papagopoulos and Michael Flynn examples, I think it's becoming quite evident that Obama was a much pushing this thing and was much more involved in this thing than probably what anyone cares to admit right now. And I think we're probably going to learn that when we get um, farther down the road here. Now, uh, Roger Stone uh, has recently asked a judge to dismiss his case. He also 
has um, stated to the judge that if his case is going to go forward, then he would like the unredacted copy of the Mueller report. Uh, pretty sure he won't get that. He'll probably get the report like everyone else. will see it with a lot of redactions. Um, he says if his case goes to trial, he his lawyer is going to subpoena Julian Assange. Now that is uh, something that they definitely do not want to have happening. You know, they can control Assange right now the way that they're going to extradite him back to the U.S. They can hold his hearings in a secret court and say, well, it's all about national security, things we can't talk about, too much classified information, so there'll be no reporters, there'll be no court recorders, there'll be nothing like that. It's going to be super secret, closed uh, hearings, and we'll never hear any testimony from Assange. We'll never hear any of the government's case. It'll all be completely sealed, uh, and we'll never know any of it. It will literally be a secret court proceeding with Assange. I don't think they'll allow him to testify in public hearings in front of Congress, uh, certainly not in the court of law, but if you get into a situation where maybe um, uh, Stone's lawyers uh, call him in, call Assange in, then and that would be a different situation, uh, and Assange would maybe take the stand, who knows, and then he may uh, disclose some things I'm certain that the government does not want him to talk about. I'm, I'm still not sure they're going to go through with the uh, with the stone thing. I'm not sure if they will or not. We'll have to find out. You know, it's uh, for those of you, I'm, I'm sure many of you probably obviously know who Bill Maher is. I'm pretty sure most of you don't watch him. I can't stand the dude personally. Um, don't like Bill Maher at all. Uh, but about 1% of the time he will say something just, you know, because a broken clock is correct twice a day. Uh, Bill Maher is kind of like a broken, broken clock. Every now and then, something will come out of his mouth that makes sense. And uh, he said on his show, I believe it was on Thursday night show, that the Democrats could lose in 2020 over the immigration issue. Well, I've, I, I agree with that, but I, I think they're going to lose in 2020 for sure. I don't think it's even a, a question at this point based on the candidates we see that are running. Um, they're absolutely going to lose in 2020. Uh, and yes, he is true on the immigration issue, but it's going to be a lot more than just the immigration issue. It's the ideology that drives them to take the position they take on the immigration issue. It's the idea. It's the ideology. But Medicare for all, open borders, sanctuary cities, uh, just all these things that all fit into the you know the Green New Deal, uh, the whole nine yards. It's all just bad, bad, bad stuff. And uh, but he is right. The immigration issue is is front and center. It's way, way ahead of environmental policy or anything like that. Environmental policy uh, in the last two elections, 2018, 2016, didn't even make the top 30. People just really don't think that much about it. But immigration is a top five issue. People, That is an issue that people do care about and have cared about for a very long time. And I do believe it's going to be an issue that's going to really, really hurt Democrats, particularly in the southwestern states, border states. And uh, even in Florida, even amongst the Hispanic community, I mean, I think the Democrats just assumed that Hispanics would automatically be 100% behind their position. But we can see the polls are showing that uh, Trump is gaining uh, with that group of people. And it has a lot to do with immigration policy. And it has a lot to do with a, a lot of these people who came from um, South America and south of our border come up here. They start small businesses. Uh, these are very hardworking people. Uh, they do pay taxes. They came here illegally. They did it the right way. Uh, and uh, they absolutely, absolutely understand this issue better than any liberal Democrat, uh, you know, um, trust fund kid. And they uh, they definitely under, understand it, probably more than anyone else. And that's why uh, they are, uh, so you're seeing a lot of Latino support go to Trump on this issue. It might be the only issue they agree with Trump on quite honestly, but um, it's a powerful enough issue in the Hispanic community that it is driving a lot of, a lot of um, Hispanic people away from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, even if it's just uh, on this one issue. Very important. Well, uh, Thursday night, I guess, was the kickoff of the uh, uh, part two, round two of an evening with Bill and Hillary. <laughs> well, we know the first round of that was a disaster. So now they decide to rework it and bring along a Hollywood movie star to be to sit there and ask questions to them. But according to a liberal reporter who was there, uh, it was her words a snooze fest. Of course, 
The Clintons are terribly uninteresting people. They're really uninteresting people. They're total both political um, animals. And this is all they understand. And mostly all they talk about is themselves. Uh, but the best part of that evening, and the only part of the evening probably worth uh, actually watching or having been a part of, was this heckler who obviously paid about $200 for a front seat uh, ticket uh, to this event. And uh, not too deep into the show, this guy stands up and starts heckling them. He's standing right there in the first first row. He gets stands up and starts heckling them and says, uh, basically, this is boring. He's hollering, this is boring, and then says, hey, why don't you talk about Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> and, of course, they've removed him from the uh, from the hall. But uh, I, you can expect that this is exactly what, what you're going to get from this uh, Clinton uh, evening with the Clintons Part 2. These people are completely irrelevant. Most Democrats don't want to be anywhere within a country mile of Slick Willie because of the Me Too movement, uh, the Rotten Reverend. Uh, most Democrats, except for the uh, Hillary cultist, uh, hate her. As far as they're concerned, they got their, you know, she's the reason we got Trump, and uh, she cheated Bernie, and she's horribly corrupt, corporatist, uh, whole nine yards. These are not popular people at all. I don't know why they keep, continue to uh, throw themselves into the limelight and try to reinvent themselves. It's just not possible for these two people. Um, they have a long history. It's an ugly history. It's a criminal history, and. Um, that's why another reason why we just need to see one or both of these people put in jail just for any for, for any other reason they just won't go away they just won't go away and they really need to they really need to so I'm watching an uh, interview uh, Friday night last night Friday night last night if you're me now recording this video on Saturday <laughs> it's two days away for you on Sunday morning but uh, Friday evening, I'm watching the RT segment, and they have this woman on. I forget her name, but she's been associated with Assange for a very long time. She's one of his very best friends. She visits him and had visited him in the embassy many times, and she had just recently visited him two weeks ago, and she was talking about what a horrible situation it was there uh, where he was and uh, how he was being treated, how she was treated, uh, just going in there to talk, as well as not just him and her, but uh, Assange's lawyers, and exactly what the situation was like, and uh, quite honestly, you know, being extradited back to the United States, he'll probably find himself in a much better situation than he was in in London. But there's something she said, and I think there's a lot to take uh, from this, and I, I, I do believe this. Um, the, the, it, it did come up uh, in that conversation that he has information that would probably the government would not like to hear about, <laughs> including he knows who actually gave the emails uh, to WikiLeaks, and he could he has the document to prove it. He has the the, the, the thumb drive, um, and so a technician could look at that and determine uh, probably the source, uh, and certainly determine it was not Russia. And um, but but they're talking about that, and she's ask about, well, do you think that uh, he's got this information? Would he trade that for his freedom? Something like what we were talking about last night. And uh, she said no. She said Julian will never, ever give up his source or his sources because that would be the end of WikiLeaks. He cannot give up his sources uh, because she said no one would trust WikiLeaks anymore. The reason she said people come to WikiLeaks is because they can trust that they're going to be protected. And he said, she said, if he gives up a source, and she didn't name any names, but she said if he gives up a source, that's pretty much the end of WikiLeaks. So she's about as sure as she can possibly be, and she just talked to Assange two weeks ago, that um, he would never give up a source. And so that's something that we need to keep in mind as we move forward, uh, working from the ideas that we were having yesterday, and from what a lot of people, myself included, uh, have commented on. So let's get on to the next thing, and then we'll kind of get back to that um, in the last five minutes here. So Trey Gowdy was on Fox, and he drops a bombshell without really even, I don't think he even thought about it. I think uh, now that the Mueller report's out, I guess these guys can say things they couldn't say before. But in addition to finding out that um, there were three attempts at getting FISAs, not just one back in the summer of 2016 that failed, and one of them probably was on Michael Flynn, which is a real problem, um, especially because of what they did to get the warrant. Um, 
the, the evidence that they're going to try to use that's going to have to show for that if that gets investigated and they find out it was a setup with Halper, man oh man. Uh, Halper's got a lot of problems, by the way. He's being protected now, but that will not last. Halper is going to have to face the music. There's no question about it. He was involved in just too many things uh, that, do not, that are not uh, that are not protected by being a FBI informant. Being an FBI informant doesn't give you total carte blanche to do the things he, he did, and so he is ultimately going to be um, facing the music. You can bet on that. Uh, so Trey Gowdy um, is kind of confirming something that Papa Galopoulos was alluding to in a radio interview last week that I talked about. And Trey Gowdy uh, is basically confirming what Papa Galopoulos was saying, which is that uh, Halper and, or, or Misfit, possibly both, were wearing a wire. The first we heard about this was Papa Galopoulos. Now we have Trey Gowdy saying, yeah, um, uh, Halper or Misfit, maybe both, were wearing a wire. Someone was wearing a wire. He didn't say whether it was Halper or whether it was Misfit, but it was one of those, and maybe both, and maybe even Downer as well. So here's a good question. Uh, I, I talk a lot about, not so much as I used to, but in the early days of Tower Gate, but still from time to time, I compare Tower Gate a lot, or Spy Gate, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I compare it a lot to Watergate. It has a lot of the same type of uh, you know things going on, and um, you know in Watergate, you know the thing that was pretty extraordinary uh, is that even when quite a bit of information had come out, they tied the money from the burglars. The actual money that was in their wallets was money that actually came out of the campaign to reelect uh, Nixon, um, his his uh, reelection campaign. Um, other information had come out because of Deep Throat giving Woodward this information or, or leading him to the sources who could give him the information. There was quite a bit of damning information, and we were pretty far into Watergate. I mean, we were at the point at, at that point where the hearings were being set up, people were talking impeachment, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the battles in court were beginning uh, over uh, documents that Nixon was trying to protect. Uh, they were circling the wagons. Uh, there was a lot of smoke. Uh, it was at that point when a lot of the heat was coming down that all these people around Nixon had stuck together to that point. They had stuck together, uh, even though there was 20, 25 of them all around him that were highly compromised. Any of them probably could have cut a deal at that time, but they did not. They stayed loyal to Nixon, um, and that stayed that way until pretty late in the game when we got our first turncoat. Uh, that would have been John Dean. That would have been Nixon's lawyer, John Dean. It was John Dean who finally, uh, the pressure got to him. He caved, and John Dean is the one who finally opened up and essentially um, threw everyone else under the bus to save his neck. And so it was that John Dean moment. So I guess we're at this point now, getting pretty close to this point now, where it's time to start wondering who is going to be the John Dean of Spygate. And there's quite a few very good candidates to be the John Dean. And I'm also wondering if one of the reasons that Barr, because remember, Barr, as I said yesterday, when he came out in those hearings and said, yes, I was spying on the Trump campaign and I'm going to get to the bottom of it, um, he absolutely knew that saying that was going to draw a lot of fire on him. He knew using the word spy was probably the most hostile word he could use, and he knows what images that conjures up in people. He knew that was going to uh, evoke or provoke uh, a reaction that was going to be highly negative towards him, and that was going to spark a lot of controversy. And Barr is too smart for that just to have slipped out. That was absolutely coordinated. He knew he was going to be asked about that, and he'd already thought about what he was going to do. And what did he do? He did the ballsy thing. He set his testes on the table and said, here it is. It was, it was spying went on, and I'm looking into it. And I'm thinking, why did he do that? Well, there's probably quite a few reasons, but one reason I can think of is that maybe um, he was directing that in a lot of ways towards the high-level perps, this Gang of Eight group, and the, and the people who are at the top 
who are most likely the people who are driving force behind all that went on. That would be uh, Comey, Clapper, uh, Brennan, Yates, Lynch, Strzok, Page, Baker, all these people. And it may be that Barr purposely did that because he wanted to evoke that response. He wanted Brennan and Clapper and the rest to know that he was looking into this personally and he believes it was spying. In other words, something you did, something you shouldn't be doing. I think he did that because he wanted to rattle Comey and Clapper and Brennan. And why would he want to rattle them? Because when you rattle someone, they start thinking, uh-oh, you know, in this case, if you're Brennan, Clapper, Comey, Lynch, Yates, Strzok, Page, you know, he made it perfectly clear in that statement to all these people that he's looking into them. He's looking into what they did, and they know what they did. And it was this type of pressure that brought John Dean uh, to the point where he couldn't take it anymore, and he said, man, I'm not going to go to jail for Nixon. And that's when he started spilling his guts and ended up with 22 uh, administration officials going to jail, including two attorney generals, um, all the top people around Nixon, chief of staff on down. Um, you know, he had to resign the whole nine yards. So um, maybe the reason that Barr did that and he made that statement and talked about the uh, fact that there was spying going on, that he is investigating it, is maybe he wanted to rattle these people's cages to force them into doing something. Maybe having conversations with one another to talk about a strategy. And do you think that it's possible that Barr, prior to making that statement, has got surveillance on Comey and Clapper and Brennan and Yates and all these people? And if you can head them under surveillance and then you can uh, say something that will provoke them to, to act because they've suddenly been rattled, they might engage in some sort of conversation or something where they say something uh, that uh, could uh, be incriminating. You know, I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened, but it's very possible. But one thing's for sure, he wanted to rattle these people because he knew that's exactly what his statement would do. And it worked because we saw Clapper, Brennan, and Comey the very next day on TV commenting on it. And it did rattle them. You can look and see all three of them are rattled by, by Barr's statements because they know now that, that uh, they're not going to get away with it. They know it. And so because they know that they're not going to get away with it, now is when people start getting real nervous and they start thinking the same way John Dean did uh, back during the Watergate hearings. They start thinking, uh-oh, this attorney general, he's going to get to the bottom of this and I'm screwed. I'm screwed. And hey, I'm not going to go down. Because now Loretta Lynch is thinking, you know, she's thinking she'll be protected. And they are going to try to protect everyone uh, above Yates. You know, from, from anyone inside the Obama administration, Lynch above, they're going to try to protect them. There'll be people who will fall on the sword, and they're going to expect Sally Yates to fall on the sword. They're going to expect Comey to fall on the sword. But are Yates and Comey going to fall on, fall on their swords? Or are they going to say, no way I'm going down for these people. i got to do something. Because if they go to their lawyers, and I'm sure almost all of them have contacted their attorneys after Barr's statement, because they know now that they surely are targeted. Their lawyer is probably going to say, well, look, you know, if you were involved in something that you think is ultimately going to end up in you being criminally charged, the best thing to do is to go spill your guts and cooperate uh, with the investigation and, and hope for leniency. So now is the time, because of Barr's statement, that a lot of these people are going to start thinking very, very seriously, and they're going to be advised by their attorneys that if you think that you're compromised here, and you, this attorney general has made it perfectly clear, he is going to get to the bottom of this and if you're if you if you're if you have criminal um, liability here, uh, you know as your lawyer, I'm telling you the best thing you can do is cooperate and cut a deal. And so all these people, Yates, Lynch, Comey, all these people are now going to be looking out for themselves. Forget the team; the team's done. The team's in a world of hurt, and they're all going to be looking to take care of themselves. They're all going to be looking to cover their own butt, and they're all going to be getting legal advice telling them the same thing cut a deal. And that means turning on your uh, partners in this crime. So I think the next big shoe to drop in the next probably uh, two to four weeks maybe is that we're going to start hearing uh, rumors about certain individuals uh, in that group of eight who are going to be possibly their lawyers are going to be talking with Barr and talking about maybe 
having their client come in to uh, discuss some things in exchange for leniency. Keep your eye peeled because I think that that's coming down the pipe sooner than a lot of people think. Because these people are rattled, I can tell you that. I would be, wouldn't you? So, so just a few additional thoughts on Assange. So a lot of people in the comment section, by the way, I did read the comment section. I do appreciate everybody commenting on that because I really did want to find out what everybody thought because it happened. Remember, when I commented on that, uh, it was pretty fresh, and I hadn't had a chance to go out and look at what other people were saying or thinking. Uh, this was purely done. My comments were done without having done any research or finding out what other people thought or anything else, really, other than hearing just... Uh, a couple brief clips on Fox News where Dershowitz was interviewed and a couple other lawyer people were interviewed and were talking about how, how difficult it would be to, to uh, prosecute these charges. Uh, they were talking about the fact that the uh, crime, uh, computer fraud crime, uh, had a statute of limitations of five years. The only way they could get three more years was to tie it to terrorism. That would be extremely difficult to do. And they're talking about why would Barr, you know, why would Barr want to have Assange indicted, extradited, to bring him back here to stand trial in a case that he has practically no chance of success in. And why in the middle of everything that else that Barr has got on his shoulders right now, which is a great deal, by the way. I mean, Barr is in a tough situation. I mean, he's, he's in a situation where he may have to bring down some very high-level people, and it could turn this thing upside down. I mean, it could be a lot of... Uh, you know ramifications that you can't even think about right now. It's a it, it, it's a monster uh, set of uh, responsibilities that Barr has on his shoulders right now. And you got to wonder why, would, in the middle of all this, would he would he bring Assange in? What 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 would Assange possibly have to do? And the Assange thing is about this other case that's going on with uh, Chelsea or Bradley Manning uh, about about you know whether or not WikiLeaks helped him you know get the password uh, to to hack the D, the DoD. And all this, but this is stuff that's been going on. As you know, Manning's in jail because he won't disclose that information. And uh, why would Barr do this now? The indictment's been out there for a while. Uh, and why would he want to introduce this into the mix now with everything else he's juggling? And the only thing that makes sense to me is that Barr is not so terribly interested in that case. What he's most interested in, this is just me thinking again, what he could be most interested in is Assange is really the only person who can actually produce the evidence of who did hack the DNC or steal uh, the DNC emails and give them to WikiLeaks. Assange is still the only guy, really, uh, who they actually know or know of that can produce that evidence. And that's where Barr is. He's at the origins of this thing, and the origins are the, um, the, origins are the alleged hack of the DNC, and that issue uh, has still never been totally ironed out. And maybe Barr is just like a lot of the rest of us. You know, he's looked at the information and he's not so damn sure that the that the report by CrowdStrike is correct. He has questions about it. And that that's why I think that there's a little bit more here than what's going on. It's just not that I have this wild conspiracy theory and I'm just jumping at anything I can jump to. There's real reasons why I believe this. Real reasons why I believe this. I'm not just throwing stuff out there to get clicks. You know, there's reasons why I think this is true. And as far as the issue that a lot of us are, you know, it's like the ultimate, like the ultimate prayer is that Assange would, would give up the name of the person who we all believe stole those emails. That would be Seth Rich. But according to this woman who knows uh, Assange very well, he will never, ever, ever disclose that information, even if he, he knows it's true. He will never disclose it. But what he can do without disclosing who did steal uh, or give him the emails. He may not re reveal the source, but he can probably prove it was not Russians. That's what we have to watch for. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See you. Bye.